Hey everyone, welcome to the shop. I thought I'd do a quick little video about this dividing head that I use. I showed it in at least one of my videos, uh, most recently the video where I was um, scribing the graduations around the knee support nut for the little Trent pinion mill. Whenever I show this thing, I invariably get some questions about it. And the last video was no different. I had a few comments and a few messages from folks asking about it. So I thought I'd do a little video just to show it in a little more detail and to show a couple of the uh, modifications that I made to it. As I mentioned, this is a shop-made dividing head. Uh, you can tell pretty clearly by looking at it. Um, there's nothing wrong with the way it's made. It's uh, very functional. Uh, some things about it are rather nice. It appears that it was used, um, built rather from maybe the tailstock of a wood turning lathe, perhaps. This casting here. But they clearly used a casting off of something, and I don't exactly know for sure what this big 120-tooth gear might have come off from. You can see they uh, drilled each of the spokes for screws to hold this graduation ring in place around here. It has plain um, spindle bearings and a little spindle lock and of course uh, a 120 to 1 uh, ratio from the hand wheel here. What I thought we'd do is uh, take it apart and have a look at the components. And at the same time, you get to see some of the changes that I've made to it. First and foremost, you can see I've got a spindle adapter on the front here. Uh, the threads that were on the front of the spindle were, I can't remember offhand, the same threads that the little um, Craftsman 101 and Atlas uh, 618 lathes. Uh, use. That wasn't of much use to me, so I made this adapter to be able to use my own lathe chucks on it. I thought about boring the spindle all the way through and machining it to take some sort of small collets, like perhaps the 8mm collets that the watchmaker's lathe takes. Um, I'm not sure if I'll ever bother with that or not. This thing is really borderline too big for the milling machine that I use it on, that little uh, little machine shop mini mill. It works, but uh, it, it's kind of bulky and awkward. So not much more needs to be said about the spindle uh, thread adapter. The other modification I made was the hand wheel. We'll get to that in a moment in more detail, but the hand wheel that came on it um, this is pretty nicely made. Even had a little zeroable graduated collar here. But the graduations around it, I have another 15 of them. So it didn't really give me the resolution I was after. And you can see they're spaced really far apart. So one of the things I wanted was a much larger graduated dial with many, many more graduations around it. The worm disengages from the uh, gear here just with a wing nut. So you can see it. You can see it's a pretty simple arrangement there. If you swing it out far enough, the wheel completely disengages. You can see this has got a little oiler on it. The spindle has a couple oilers too. There's you know, certainly some thought put into this. We will start by taking the spindle out here.
then I set a screw on the gear itself here. You can see they've put some sort of sleeve inside of the gear here, presumably to take it down to the correct diameter. There's no key on, no keyway rather, on the spindle. So you really have to be careful about this gear slipping if you have the spindle locked and turn the hand wheel hard enough. Now there's a lot of mechanical advantage there so this gear can actually slip if you're not aware of that. I'm not really sure why I've never put a detent or a keyway in for the set screw. Probably should do that one of these days. <clears throat> We're going to come back to this gear and this um, indexed ring in a moment. And the spindle, pretty nicely machined. It doesn't appear to have had a ton of use. When I got it, it was well oiled. I keep it well oiled. I'm not really sure this thing ever got a whole lot of use. You can see there's a brass or bronze, mm, looks like brass thrust washer on the front of the spindle. And inside, just plain bearing surface. So it seems to be just steel and cast iron. Nothing terribly wrong with that. Not a whole lot to the spindle locking screw here. Again, you know, pretty pretty well thought out. The screw itself is brass, so it doesn't mar up the spindle where it hits it. Keep this up this way. So one of my challenges with the hand wheel mounting here was how to attach it effectively without needing to remake any of these other existing parts, like the uh, little worm bearing housing here. The original hand wheel here, you know, it just had a set screw that engaged with the uh, shaft on the end of the worm here. And there was a witness mark scribed into the top of the the housing for the worm. Since I wanted such a large diameter hand wheel, I needed some additional uh, housing that was larger diameter for a witness mark to line up with my graduated ring. So as you can see, I have it attached here, but it's not readily apparent how it's attached. Um, we'll take this apart in a second, but in a nutshell, I have two screws going through the face of this housing this way into holes that I drilled and tapped into the front of the housing here. Then the hand wheel itself still fits over the shaft of the worm here with a set screw. But since this housing's in the way now, Access to the set screw is through this machined recess in the housing here. So you got to turn the hand wheel, line it up so you can get to the screw in order to loosen it. Let me take that off. And this is also obviously quite a bit, you know, further out than in the original hand wheel. The, the worm shaft doesn't go out nearly that far.
And the screw has to be taken all the way out. It can't just be loosened. Should slide right off now. <clears throat> You can see there's our hand wheel. This outer diameter here, I had some real bad slipping in the chuck when I was holding it. I was machining it. Never bothered cleaning them up. This is a zeroable hand wheel as well, the collar when you loosen this set screw here. Can be turned to re-zero. This guy out. This again, this is a little screw that I made for it. The brass tip. If we're really good, we can get this apart. There's a spring detent in here. It's also a pretty close fit. So we can work it apart. There we go. See if I can find where the detent is to avoid this springing all over the place. There it is. This is the first time I've had this apart since putting it on here. It's kind of interesting to see what things look like now. This is all the molly grease I had put in here when I assembled it. I don't know if molly grease is the best thing to use for aluminum on aluminum. If there's anything better I should be using <laughs> other than not having aluminum against aluminum in the first place, uh, let me know in the comments. There it is. You can see I've got a ring uh, groove machined around the inside to fit against this spring-loaded uh, ball bearing here to act as a detent. It keeps it located and pulled up against this face of the uh, hand wheel. So if you've ever wondering, wondered about making a, a zeroable hand wheel with a you know, collar like this, this is probably one of the simpler ways to do it. There's a little spring in the ball down here so they don't get lost. And the hand wheel housing, you can see, let's take the worm out before we lose it. Now this worm here, I think was pilfered off of something, uh, whoever made this dividing head, I don't think made this uh, worm for it. When I got it, it had this brass extension pressed into it, and that's what this hand wheels affixed to. Inside here, I don't know if you can see, there's two screws that hold this housing in place against this housing. This ring on the hand wheel I made has 90 graduations around it. So being 120 to 1 ratio, there are 3 degrees in one complete revolution of the hand wheel. So if you take the 90 divisions, split them into 3 degrees, that gives us 30 degrees for each... I'm sorry, 30 divisions for each degree around the hand wheel here. And for anything I'm apt to do, that'll be plenty. You'll notice that this does not have the facility to take indexing plates of any sort. Um, I don't think I'll bother with that. 
if I really feel like that's cramping my style, then I'll probably just get a different dividing head. Uh, I'm not going to take this off. It was uh, really a pain in the butt to get this uh, attached and aligned nice and concentric with the, uh, the worm spindle here. It's just a little bit of movement in those mounting screws that let me get it perfectly lined up. But it was a lot of trial and error, taking it apart, putting it back together, adjusting it. So we don't need to take that off right now. So one other thing I didn't care for about the dividing head when I got it were the divisions around this ring here. This is a, this is one degree divisions, 360 degrees worth. And my problem with it was that they were backwards from what I wanted. I've never used a commercial, commercially made dividing head before. Um, so I, I don't know if this is you know, standard or not, but I wanted a uh, clockwise rotation of the hand wheel to move these graduations, um, you know, in the positive direction. When I got this clockwise movement of the hand wheel moved these graduations in the negative direction. So what I ended up doing was chucking this in the lathe and facing off this whole surface here, uh, the numbers stamped into the graduations that were that were on here uh, were pretty sloppy too. A lot of mine are a little bit sloppy, um, but uh, somebody used a pretty large, you know, relatively to the the work here. Somebody used a fairly large stamp, um, so the numbers ran into the the longer divisions, and they're they're a little uh, bit all over the place. So I used a uh, 16-inch tall number stamps on this afterwards. And I did the graduations using the dividing head itself. After facing this, I reassembled the dividing head and bolted it to the bed of the lathe and set up a little scribing tool on the lathe just to go around and you know put in marks of uh, different depths or different lengths, you know, all the way around it for each degree. You can see every, uh, every fifth one here is longer. I made up these little aluminum spacing jigs to control the length of the lines while I was putting them around. That made it a pretty brainless mechanical operation. Less chance for screwing up when you're doing 360 you know, divisions like that. It's easy for your mind to wander and then you make a mistake. And worse still, sometimes you don't realize you've made a mistake until the very end. In practice, when I use this to do much of anything, you know, if I, if I require, you know, any sort of accuracy other than, you know, lining the pointer up with the, the degree markers here, doing a, an oddball number of divisions especially. I'll use a table of cumulative um, positions for each index. Um, I have a little um, Android app that I wrote that I can run on my smartphone. Uh, I can punch in the number of divisions and it gives me the, uh, um, you know, the arc length between each division and a table of all of the cumulative um, angular positions for all of the uh, indexing positions. And that you know, makes it pretty easy on something like this where you can, you know, for each position, estimate the exact angle um, with, with whatever you're able to on your hand wheel. And that, you know, rough approximation for each position doesn't result in any compounding, you know, accumulating error as you uh, go around the positions. So let's see, we have 30 divisions for each degree on the hand wheel here. 
Now, if I'm doing my math right in my head, that's two arc minutes per um, hand wheel graduation. That's pretty good resolution. I mean, there's there's going to be more error than that in you know my fixturing and setup, and and probably within the engagement of the the worm and the gear here. When you get used to using a dividing head that way, uh, with an, an iterative number of um, you know absolute indexing positions around your work, uh, it makes you feel a lot more comfortable with um, doing things like cutting a gear with a prime number of teeth, for example. You know, something that you can't really do with uh, an indexing plate on a dividing head. I'm going to go ahead and put this thing back together. Well, I guess that's about it. I figured I'd try something a little different this time with kind of a quick informal video. If there's anything else in my videos that you guys notice that you want to see more details about in this sort of format, uh, definitely let me know. I do plan on doing more of these, um, you know, with particular things around the shop. Um, but that's just things that I think are interesting, not necessarily what you guys are interested in. Um, yeah, so let me know. Um, in the meantime, Look forward to the next Trent Pinion Mill video coming out soon. Quick little teaser. This is the column casting with the dovetails milled. Came up pretty nice, I think. So until next time, see you later.